Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. We are continuing with our story of the um, the legend of the Pesor family. Um, we've done multiple parts to this, but don't worry. I'll put everything down in the description box below in case you missed the original parts we did on this. But don't worry, I'm going to recap anyway, so you don't you don't have to worry about going back and re-listening to those first. You can go back and re-listen to them at a separate time if you feel inclined to do so. Now, it's so fascinating that we're covering this family at this time in our timeline, in our historic timeline, kind of like the Borgias too. Like It's kind of interesting that we're covering the Borgias during this time as well. I do want to say, though, since we are living in such hectic and chaotic times i can't you guys know what i'm talking about uh, we have to be careful about what we say on on the youtube but i do want to just tell you guys that i am filming this on monday july 22nd and i believe that this is going to be released on friday august 2nd so we're a little bit over under two weeks filming from when we released this so if anything else has happened in that two week span and i don't mention it that's why <laughs> i'm not cold-hearted i just I'm, I'm coming at you from the past as you're, as you're watching this. I hope that makes sense. So anyway, again, just to reiterate, um, on this channel, we are a deep dive channel. We are also a, jan a channel that takes everything with a grain of salt. We are here trying to seek the truth in this crazy, crazy world. Seek the truth behind the matrix, behind the establishment. In saying that, again, we take everything with a grain of salt. I've said before there is um, there are real conspiracies and then there are junk conspiracies and sometimes we don't know we the public don't know which is which okay and so I think that it would be who of us to like just kind of acknowledge everything but not acknowledge everything at the same time so that we're able to stay grounded and keep our wits about us as we move forward as more and more disclosure comes at us rapidly. Okay, so we know that when people start to become aware of when they start to wake up from the programming and they become aware of the greater world around them, what the establishment tends to do is you can't put someone back to sleep, right, once they've realized certain truths. Um, and so what the establishment tends to do is that they do create these junk conspiracies um, to distract us. Yeah, it's kind of like a Trojan horse, right? They infiltrate into a community of people trying to seek the truth, and they put junk out there to either make us look crazy or keep us spinning in the junk conspiracy cul-de-sac, ch chasing our tail while the real stuff is happening over here. And so we just have to be very, very very aware of that we also have to know that there uh, two things can be true right like you can have a person who is a descendant of an establishment family who isn't bad i think a lot of us actually descend from i know i do from an establishment family and we're not bad every single human being has to be judged on his or her own actions separate from their family and i think sometimes in the truth or community we get so um invested and, and emotionally charged by these stories that we hear from these certain families that we tend to jump the gun and we tend to like try to destroy anybody with a particular last name and that's not fair and that does not make us right or good right we have to be fair with every single person on this planet just as you can't control who your family is they can't control who their family is okay i also want to remind you guys that just because somebody is rich doesn't mean they're bad when we're talking about a family like the pesors even though I do think there's a little bit of truth to this legend, myself personally at this time, we have to remember though, and saying that, just because somebody is rich does not make them bad. All right, there's plenty of people out there who are very wealthy, who are really good people, and would do anything, give you the shirt off their back. Just because somebody owns a bunch of companies doesn't mean they're bad necessarily. They could just be really good at business. So again, with that being said, today we're going to look at Daniel Pesor, and I think it's Jonas Pesor is the other Pesor we're going to look at. We're looking through Stephen Pesor's um, 
accumulation of his work into his own family called the book of Daniel. There'll be a link down in the description box below. If you want to purchase this book, just so you guys know, um, just to make it clear, a lot of people know this, but in the United States, under Section 107 of the Fair Use Policy, this goes under the First Amendment of Freedom of Speech, we do have the right to look at copyrighted material, be it a song, a movie, a book, and give commentary on it. So if I, I know some, some people just want me to read this book, and that's that. If I were to just read this book and that be that and not give commentary or my opinion, then I would at that point be in violation of copyrights, okay? Um, but because we read through this stuff and we talk about it and we give our opinions and we use it for educational purposes, we are then at that point in fair use, okay? So if you are somebody who is just interested in having the book read to you, there's a lovely little app on your phone called Audible. And there are certain, these are books on tape. And a lot of times the author of the books will actually read the books themselves on tape and you can purchase the book on tape from Audible. But if that's what you're looking for on my channel, A, I can't do that because that's a copyright violation. And B, that's not what we're here for on this channel. We're here to discuss things, to look at things, even though I'm hosting this. And I'm the only one speaking right now. I expect to see people's reactions in the comment section of what they think is going on. Please be careful what you say, though. You guys know that words are important in this battle and we have to watch certain words. So just be very careful. If you put a comment and you see it's gone, it might be because there was a word in there that triggers the algorithm in a negative way. So just be very, very careful. Okay. You, most of you guys know, you know what to do. Use the pretend words, you know, instead of the, the real ones. <laughs> or use asterisks when you're are numbers in the word when you're writing the word just to make sure that um you know we don't we don't trigger the algorithms so let's give a brief recap before we get into daniel pesor and jonas pesor for those who are new to this really very fascinating legend i think i've said this like in every episode but it's stuff like this this is why i started my channel because i find these legends so fascinating especially as an american and i think our canadian friends our australian friends our south african friends kind of probably have the same maybe relationship to these legends because we are countries of immigration allegedly according to the main the main narrative of history and so how people got where they are through their family line it's so fascinating anyway but the fact that this connects to the establishment and there's all these whispers behind closed doors about what this family is actually doing makes it even more juicy so just a little bit of a recap so again we're looking at the work the archives, the history of, of the Pesor family. And this is put together by a man named Stephen Pesor. Now, at the beginning of the book, I actually really like Stephen Pesor. I think he's quite funny. Uh, if you watch the first part, he, he talks about how crazy some of this stuff sounds. And like, he's like, some of this stuff is so crazy. It can't be true, but some of it's crazy enough to be true. I'm kind of paraphrasing what he says. And he talks about how, you know, again, take everything with a grain of salt. Even though this is his own family, he doesn't really know, like, if this is accurate or not. And so I like this dude. I think this dude is, I, I respect him for putting out his research into his own family. Obviously, he's probably not somebody who's involved in the establishment if he's willing to put this out. You know, that's just kind of my opinion of the situation and so again it is there are a lot of typos in here so sometimes sentences might might read weird and it is because it's self-published and no no i mean we all make typos i make typos all the time and so when you self-publish you don't have an editor right and so that's totally fine i'm just really grateful to this steven guy for putting this out in kind of an entertaining way so again just to recap how the road so far how we got to where we are now if you want to skip uh, forward a few minutes you're welcome to if you've been following along otherwise just a very quick recap so we're talking about this particular family in the united states who lives in north carolina in the southeast where i live and this legend that not only are they one of the most powerful families in the world and not only are they one of the families pulling the strings behind closed doors of our society but they got to this seat of power because of one particular ancestor. And this is the ancestor named Daniel Pesor. Now, this dude, Daniel, 
really lived. So this is a real person that we're talking about, a real someone's grandpa, someone's great, great grandpa. Like this is a real dude. Now the mystery is who was Daniel? It could very well be that Daniel is really a Pesor and was born here in the United States and became a very powerful business person. That is absolutely a possibility. However, the legend states that Daniel isn't actually a Pesor. That Daniel was the last Dauphin of France. So a Dauphin is like a prince. So this takes us back to the French Revolution with Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth. Right. We, we most of us know, you know, the the legend of they have no bread and they didn't let them eat cake, which we don't know if Marie Antoinette actually said that this was right after the American Revolution. Um, this inspiration of revolution was kind of happening all over the world at this point. We know astrologically and then in the tail end of the 18th century or the 1700s, we're looking at mir now at this point in our, in our timeline, we're mirroring as astrologically, we're mirroring that time. So we see this very kind of aggressive need for revolution, this aggressive anger towards the establishment or the monarchies, this huge separation between the haves and the have nots. I mean, we saw that with drunk grandma, which is what we call Nancy P. I don't want to say her full name. In my house, we call her drunk grandma. Um, and, and during during the 2020 summer, remember, she was eating like designer ice cream when the rest of us were literally under house arrest, not making money. So it's the same energy, right? It's the same type of, of, of friction happening between two demographics of people for the most part. So Marie Antoinette was a Habsburg. She married Louis the 16th, who was a bourbon. Again, if we've talked a lot about the bourbon line um, from Henry the fourth that took the throne after the house of Valois fell and they're cousins, they're all family. But um, this is also the bourbon family also again, connects back to the Borgias. We have a lot of bourbon descendants who are also Borgias as well. Another deep dive we're doing on this channel right now. So Marie Antoinette, Louis the 16th, they're in power. They are the monarchy of France during the French revolution. And we talked about last week, they did try to escape at one point to Austria, didn't work. They were brought back. Marie Antoinette, Louis the 16th, and their two surviving children were placed in a prison. Okay. And I think even though people say it was just shocking that they ended up um, unaliving Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI, because they were like, oh, people didn't realize they would actually do that to a monarchy, which I scratch my head and be like, why wouldn't they do that? They've done it to a monarchy before. Look at the English Civil War. King Charles got in the English Civil War. So they've done this to royal people have done the people have fought back before against the monarchy. So I don't know why Marie Antoinette and Louis the 16th wouldn't possibly be fearing that inevitability because it's happened before. But nonetheless, they're put on, in a prison. So it's Marie Antoinette, Louis the 16th, their two children. So the two surviving children they had at the time of their arrest was a daughter named Maria Teresa and a son named Louis Charles. The daughter was older. Louis Charles himself, who is the focal point of the story, was eight years old at the time of his captivity. Now, once the parents were unalived, once the parents met their, their date at the guillotine, because of French law at that time, even though Louis Charles, the son, was only eight, he automatically became Louis the 17th because his father was unalived. Again, he's eight years old, though. Um, and so with Maria Teresa, she wasn't a threat at this point because daughters in, in the French law with a lot of monarchies, not necessarily the United Kingdom, but most monarchies in continental Europe, they had this particular law where daughters could not inherit the throne. So if we look at like the French monarchy, daughters have and could inherit the throne. They were just bumped to the end of the children. So like, Look at like Queen uh, Mary, Bloody Mary, Queen Elizabeth I. They were the sisters of Edward. And Edward was actually put on the throne after his father passed away. And then he 
passed away early. And so then it went to his sisters. Well, first it went to a cousin Jane and that's a story for a different day. So even though like monarchies like England would allow women to reign as a, as, as the actual monarchy, the boys always came first. So even recently it's just changed. Like with princess Charlotte, she holds now the second in line under her brother George. She doesn't get bumped down because of Louis. That's just recently changed in the United Kingdom. But in France, girls can't rule, period. Now, if Marie Theresa were to have a son, that son would be in line for the throne. But at this point, she's a little girl, right? She doesn't have, I don't even know if she had her period yet, right? So she's not really a threat to the revolution. But Louis Charles absolutely is. So they exile Maria Theresa. They exile her outside of France. And I do have to say, as brutal as the French Revolution was, I have to kind of say, like, they did, I have to say, like, good job. Like, they didn't hurt the children. And, and I think that speaks volumes of their, um, even though they were very brutal to the adults, I think we see a, a glimmer of humanity when the children are involved. Because even though the children are being held in a prison, they don't unalive them. You know, they're still, see these, these are just children. They exile Maria Teresa, a little girl to her family. And allegedly what they do, as far as the official narrative, is Louis Charles is then adopted out to a family in France, a revolutionary family, where he is kind of deprogrammed to, to, to understand that the monarchy isn't a good thing. He does end up passing away of a sickness as a child. But nonetheless, that's the official story. So now we get into the legend. So as the friction was happening between the haves and the haves not during this volatile time in France and the French Revolution, we have a small group of people, mostly nobility, who were what we call royalist. Now, royalists are people who support the monarchy. Even in the American Revolution, there were some Americans, some patriots who were royalists who did not want our colonies to be separated from Great Britain. All right, so this small group of royalists decided that in order to save the monarchy, they needed to extract Louis the Seventeenth, Louis Charles, after his father was unalived from the prison as an eight-year-old little boy. They needed to extract him from the prison, get him into safety, keep him in safety until he's old enough to claim the throne of France back. So how do they do this? Well, they find a little boy who is a cousin of Louis Charles through the Habsburgs. He looks, he looks a lot like Louis Charles. And so what they do is they put this little boy, this little boy is also very sick. He doesn't have long to live. They put him into a rocking horse. They drug him and put him into a rocking horse. And they bring the rocking horse into the prison. So Louis Charles has a toy to play with under the guise of, of a toy for Louis Charles to play with. They get the cousin out. They switch clothes and they put Louis Charles at the bottom of a laundry basket. At this point, he's wearing like peasantry clothes. And they take the laundry out, leaving the cousin behind in the prison. Now, I think this is kind of diabolical to do like, why save one life? To get, like, why give one life to save another? This is kind of, if this is true, this is kind of diabolical. You know, they're kind of like, well, this this kid's going to die anyway, so we might as well just put it. Like, that's so inhumane. But nonetheless, that's the story. And so this little cousin is now sitting in the prison as Louis Charles. And he does, as far as the story goes, if, if this is true, he is the one that's actually sent to a, another person's house where he eventually passes away as they thought he would be. So at this point, as far as what the general populace think, they think that Louis Charles is no longer living. Right. But meanwhile, he's in hiding with these royalists and he has kind of a wild life. Like he's taken down to Egypt and he kind of helps participate at 12 years old in this like war that's happening. And um, the guy who's his protector ends up being unalived. And so he leaves like a million dollars to Louis Charles. Around this time, Napoleon is Napoleon around um, Europe doing Napoleon's thing. And Napoleon finds out, according to the legend, that Louis Charles is still alive. 
So he finds out that the royalists have pulled the wool over everybody's eyes. And this kid is just waiting in the shadows to take his throne back. So at that point, Napoleon goes on a voyage, on a quest to find this kid. So the royalists are like, oh, crap, what do we do? And so they get in touch with the English royal family. At this point is Mad King George, King George III, and his wife, Queen Charlotte. This is the, the monarchy that lost the American Revolution. Well, Queen Charlotte, she w- she's related to the Habsburgs. So she is a cousin to this little boy. So, of course, she brings this little boy into the court of England And then from here, they have to figure out what to do because it is dangerous. I mean, the English monarchy has already lost the American colonies. This revolution is in the air. They know what's going on in France. And so having Louis Charles protected by the English court is extremely dangerous. But he's still a child and he's still family. So they devise a plan. And at this point in the English court, also seeking asylum, is a man named George Pesor. George was the the literal Pesor for the French royal family. And again, he sought asylum at the English court. Now, the word Pesor means weight master. Okay, so basically he was the accountant. He weighed the gold and the silver. He paid the bills for the um, the monarchy, the French monarchy. So he was obviously very close to a, a close confidant to um, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette. And so they devised this plan where they're going to send George to America, to the newly found American country, the United States, and he is going to take with him. Louis Charles. But Louis Charles is going to start going under the name Daniel Pesor, as in George's son. Now, at this point, because America is its own country, it's not a colony anymore, we have a little problem because the king has no jurisdiction over the colonies. However, after the American Revolution, the new American, the fledgling American government said, you know what? If there are people here in our new country who have land that was granted to them by the crown before the American Revolution, we're just going to grandfather you in. We're not going to kick you off your land. We're just going to let you keep your land, which was very fair, I feel like, to the American government. And so what King George did is he forged a deed, basically under his father's name, the king that ruled before him, saying that George was allotted, this family was allotted some land in North, what is now North Carolina, um, and they backdated it so that the government would have to grant the land to this family. Okay, so that's how they end up in North Carolina. Now, again, I'm going to reiterate to you guys, these are French speaking people. Okay. A lot of people are under the impression that the only real French stronghold in the United States is New Orleans. That is not true. New Orleans was not a part of the United States until the early 1800s, until the Louisiana Purchase. New Orleans went back and forth between the French and the Spanish and was predominantly Catholic. However, the colonies were predominantly Protestant. During the War of Religions in France, a lot of French Huguenots, who were Protestants, came to the southeastern part of the United States, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, to an English colony because of for religious purposes. So a lot of people, including myself, I have a lot, I'm, I'm mostly French and English from both sides of my family, okay? So at the point, this point in time, when the Pesors came to North Carolina, there were a lot of French-speaking people in this area. There were a lot of French communities in this area. Now you don't find that in the Southeast. It's all kind of been English. You know, even my first name, Bryce, with an I is Brice. It's my mother's maiden name. They're from Charleston, South Carolina. They were French. But we say Bryce now because that's the English way, right? And we're in an English-speaking place. My dad's mom, her last name was Bennett, but it was actually Benet. It was spelled Benet. 
but they took the English pronunciation because they, they were also French Huguenots, right? And over time, they just adapted to English culture. But at this time, in, in specifically, there are still a lot of native French speakers that will eventually, again, evolve its way out. So this is not weird. You know, I don't want people, this part of the legend is not unthinkable. It would not have been surprising at all for the people, the community in North Carolina to welcome in another, another French family. Half of them are already French. Yeah. So with that being said, then as time goes by, obviously the main goal, we've got these legends of Jean Lafitte, the pirate being a handler. He ends up in North Carolina. Allegedly, we've got apparently, allegedly Marshall Michelle Ney, who took the name Peter Stewart Ney, handling the situation in North Carolina. Um, we talked about the Marquis de Lafayette yesterday and his stop off in this area of North Carolina. So we have all these weird spinning circles around this family, these weird things. And none of this can be totally proven. You know, again, with Lafayette, Lafitte, as I said, with the, we got a lot of pirate stories down here in the South too. So that's not weird either. Uh, my boyfriend, I said, he's a descendant of a pirate. One of his ancestors, Peter Knight was a pirate. So it's, it's a very famous pirate actually. So it's, this is very common for the Southeast. Um, nothing really odd and weird about it, but it's just interesting when you put everything together on its own, it's really a nothing burger. But putting it all together, it does look very suspicious. Very suspicious. I will say that. If if these people really were Lafitte or, you know, Michelle Ney, it's suspicious. Okay. And so we believe the trajectory of Daniel. They, they, we believe that the plan for a long time was still when it was time for Daniel to be brought back to France to reclaim the throne. But as we know, that never happened. And maybe we'll learn more in this research as to why it never happened. We know that Napoleon ended up becoming an emperor. And then he stepped down for Louis the 18th, who was Louis the 17th's uncle, his father's brother, who then took the throne and it just it gets weird it gets weird in france with with going back and forth between prime ministers and napoleon and the, the king it's just kind of a weird time of trying to figure out what's that how the governmental structure is actually going to be run and so maybe it was just kind of thought by the powers that be okay well we can't put him back on the throne it's just not going to work the way we thought it was going to work so why don't we just give him his own power as daniel pesor we're going to see though Okay, the Pesor family is a very wealthy family. Very, this is this is true. This is a, some, a lot of this story is circumstantial and speculation, but we have some literal truth here. There really was a guy named Daniel Pesor. Was he born Daniel or was he born Louis Charles? We don't know. Is he a good guy or is he a bad guy? We don't know. We do know that this particular family, though, got exceedingly wealthy. Could they have gotten wealthy through being really good at business? Possibly. Could they be really good people who are also really wealthy? Possibly. Could they be really bad people who are part of the establishment who are really wealthy and powerful? Possibly. You know, there's all these possible probabilities and possibilities out there. And so we're just kind of looking at the story and keeping the story, keeping an um, open mind with the story about any possibility being a probability, right? Um, but these people do exist. These are real people that exist. Okay, so let's get into it. We're, again, we're going to talk about Daniel Pesor now, the actual who is allegedly Louis Charles, the Dauphin of France. All right, so according to Thomas Marino in his book, Pesor, 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 Together at Last, George Pesor Jr. was born in 1764 in Maryland. He moved to North Carolina with his father, George Sr., and mother, Carlotta, and siblings in 1770, so like five years before the kickoff of the American Revolution. George Jr. married Hannah Hoyle in Lincoln County, North Carolina in 1780. George and Hannah are both buried in the old Kastner Cemetery in what is now Gaston County. According to Marino, George Jr. died in 1851, and Hannah, his wife, had died before in 1844. Before their deaths, they brought into this world eight children, one of which was Daniel Pesor. Daniel was born in 1793 and was the third son and fourth child of George Jr. 
1814, Daniel married Suzanne Kaiser in Lincoln County, North Carolina. Both Daniel and Suzanne, Suzanne were buried in the Daniel Paysor Cemetery, now called the Walnut Grove in Gaston County, North Carolina. Daniel passed in 1867 and Suzanne in 1875. According to the records, they had 10 children. This is as close as we can get to an official record of Daniel. In the previous chapter, it was pointed out that the Dauphin, Louis Charles of France, son of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, was actually Daniel Pesor. There seems to be some discrepancy here, though. Daniel was born in 1793, and the Dauphin was born in 1785. That's an eight-year difference. So how can this be resolved? And this is actually, in my opinion, kind of a problem, the eight-year difference. I mean... At a certain point when you're adult, a lot of times, like I'm 41, there might be a 33-year-old if we were to sit next to each other. We probably look around the same age, right? So, but when you're kids, eight years, eight years is a big difference, right? So that's a huge discrepancy in their birth. Okay, so let's go on. Maybe it can't be resolved, but here are a few considerations. Louis Charles the Dauphin was known to be small for his age, especially after suffering a prolonged illness while in prison. This could account for mistaking him as a younger boy, let's say a two or three year difference. At age 50 or so, a five year difference in appearance could be negotiable, as I was just saying. And he's right, yeah, he's saying the same thing I am. Like, as a child, that's going to be obvious. But here's the thing, too, I think about as well. Like, if we're looking at the official narrative, people knew what the royalty looked like because of their paintings. But it wasn't like today, where we have social media, where we have TV, where it's in our faces all the time. And so there could possibly have been a situation where they could have done an eight-year difference and people just didn't know because they weren't privy to close-up information about the, lo the lost off on like we are today. Does that make sense? You know, like it wasn't just in their faces all the time, right? And so, so maybe it was easier back then to kind of pull the wool over people's eyes than it is now. Let me know your thoughts on that. Anyway, in the United States in the late 1700s and early 1800s, there was a very little form of record keeping. Kind of just, kind of just said that. Most births and death records were simply a notion in a family Bible. Yep. Of course, these notations are often very accurate, particularly if the family notes them right away. However, as years go by, sometimes memories become fuzzy. So the accuracy of these records is largely dependent upon who made the notations and how long from the event they were made. And just a funny story, my grandfather, my dad's dad, um, he did that with, and, and, and there's a Watson family Bible. And at, as all of us were born, as his grandchildren were born, he wrote down in that Bible, our time of birth, our date of birth and our weight and length at birth. And I don't know where that Bible is. I don't know who has it now because my parents are, my grandparents are no longer living, but all of us, myself, my sister, my cousins were all listed in the family Bible. So this, this, uh, this um, tradition of writing this stuff down probably still goes on in some families, even though we have actual medical records now. I mean, I even 1983, I got a birth certificate, you know, like, so, so that's a very good point he's making is that it depends on. So if, if somebody is, if a child is born and somebody's there to write it down right away, it's probably going to be pretty accurate. But if they wait a while to write it down, there could be some, dis uh, some discrepancy in, in the actual time of the birth. Daniel was the third born son of George, yet by all accounts in the family lore, there was something different about him. All of George's children lived in the same general area from Kings Mountain, North Carolina, on up to Lincoln County and Catawaba County areas. All of them are farmers and or dealt in trading with their friends and neighbors. All had basically the same schooling and educational levels, but there were some differences. Many family members have commented after reading old letters written by Daniel that he seemed to be much more educated than his brothers and sisters. His syntax, vocabulary, and even his penmanship appears to be much better than his siblings. One of his descendants once said that Daniel couldn't be a pesor because 
he was too smart. Also, through the years, there have been persistent rumors of a chest of gold that was owned by Daniel. There have been none of these rumors associated with any of his brothers and sisters. There are even stories of this chest being buried on land once owned by Daniel along the base of Pesor Mountain in Gaston County, North Carolina. Some of that land is still in the Pesor family, and over the years, quite a few half-hearted attempts have been made to locate the chest. None have been successful. I am so close to this geographical location, y'all. I think I need to go on a road trip. I think I need to go on a road trip and I need to explore this area. It's also interesting to note that there have been numerous individuals and commercial attempts at gold mining in that area. And I will also say, I want to note this too. There are tons of rumors of buried gold in this area because we had so many damn pirates. <laughs> we had so many pirates here that there are so many rumors of, 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 of pirates gold buried all over the southeast so that makes me wonder if if it was rumored that daniel had a chest of gold buried somewhere could that be another story associated with another pirate that kind of got merged with the daniel story i don't know just thought that was interesting like this is not rare this is not a rare story for you guys who might be from another country like this is normal <laughs> like we got that's why the Southeast, the Deep South is so freaking fantastic. It's so eccentric where I live. There's so much of this stuff, right? So this is not abnormal to, to, to know there's buried treasure somewhere. Whether it belonged to Daniel or not, it's one of probably a thousand other buried treasured stories in the Southeast. Some gold has been found, but so far not enough to make it commercially viable proposition. Since not very much of the gold has been found, why would people in the 1800s and later assume that any gold would be found there? Perhaps it is because that one of the residents of the area seemed to have more than his share of rare metal. Daniel was known to have been relatively well off financially, his son Jonas even more well off. Where did this wealth come from? We could only surmise, but if Daniel was indeed the lost Dauphin of France, it seems to reason that he would have had access to at least a certain amount of funds. Yes and no. We know that he was sent with what would today be a million dollars when he went to the court of England. A million dollars, don't get me wrong, I would not turn down a million dollars if he gave it to me. But at this point, if, if we're comparing this to today's money, that's what it would be in comparison to today's money. Sadly, that's not really life-changing money. Unless you can invest it well, you know, like... That stuff is going to, if you only have a million dollars, it's going to run out in generations. Now, with him being a lost Alphon, yeah, absolutely. Princes do have access to wealth like the rest of us don't have access to. However, due to the French Revolution, I feel like a lot of those, that access had been cut off. And with Napoleon coming in, Napoleon was the emperor. He took full ownership of any of the monarchy wealth. In France, so I don't know if he would have, if he was the lost Dauphin, if he really would have had access to the amount of money that they're claiming Daniel Pesor had, especially if he's going under a different name for his own protection. Okay, and again, with the royalists that could have gotten him this money over time, because he was such a young child, they're going to start passing away. And as they start to pass away, the knowledge, the people who know who he really is are going to become few and far between to the point where it merely becomes a legend in 2024, right? So I don't know if that's actually thinking, critically thinking about that. I don't know if that's why he got super wealthy because he could just access royal funds. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. All right. As you can remember from an earlier chapter, Louis Charles came into an inheritance. Yep. From over one million, I, I just I just spoke about that. Also, with the con conspiracy to hide the Dauphin to get him out of danger, it is reasonable to assume that some of the royal possessions were able to leave the country with him. I don't agree with that. I don't think that any of the royal possessions left. He was smuggled in a laundry basket out of the prison. I don't believe that they're going to be putting a bunch of like jewels in the laundry basket with him, and. I don't believe that the Bourbon family was able to collect 
their riches when they were arrested. I mean, I don't know many people who are allowed to like go through their house and grab money when they're arrested. I don't think the royal family, I don't think the peasants, the commoners, the revolutionaries would have allowed that to happen, right? Because money is power and money can buy their way out of prison. So I don't think that's an accurate statement. Just my own critical thinking, I don't think that would have happened. All right. After all, his father, Louis XVI, was one of, if not the richest person in all of Europe. Even so, a small amount of his wealth would have been a very substantial amount. Yes, he was, but I don't think Louis Charles had access to that money. Now, is it possible that if Daniel was the lost Dauphin, that we have other establishment family members, like other family members in this group of people, and the Aluma Shmati? that would have sent him money to help him maybe maybe like the schmockefellers or the schmothchilds maybe they maybe the schmorsinis i'm trying to be careful guys because i don't want youtube picking this up maybe those families sent him money to help him reestablish himself because they're all in the same club right what did george carlin say it's all a club and we ain't a part of it you know, maybe that's how he got his wealth. I, but I don't think it came from his family because I think that the revolutionaries and Napoleon very much confiscated that. Yeah. All right. As was also mentioned earlier, if true, the Dauphin had a considerable help from King George III of England. They could have helped absolutely, as I was saying, other satellite families in the Aluma Shmati could have also sent him money. Besides being a distant relative of the French monarchy, King George had a fear that the revolutions in the American colonies and in France would spread to England. As with most of the monarchies in France, he didn't want that to happen in his home country. If the stories are true, it is reasonable to assume that King George III supplied young Daniel with sufficient gold and silver, along with a ship and 600 acres of land grant, to assure that his time in the Americas would not be difficult. Perhaps it was also to buy Daniel silent, silence to keep him from implicating the English monarchy in the Dolphins' escape. Yeah, because, again, as I said, as I said in the recap, if you missed it, this is dangerous. Like, to have the lost Dolphin in your court in England was very dangerous for Charlotte and for King George and their children. Look what's going on astrologically now. Same thing was happening then. They weren't stupid. They can't let the people know that they helped a prince escape. Finally, there was a series of interesting coincidences that occurred during Daniel's lifetime. A Frenchman, Peter Ney, came to the area, as noted earlier. Ney confessed on his deathbed that he was, in fact, Michel Ney, one of Napoleon's top generals, and named Marshal Ney, Marshal of France. As noted in Ney's history, he served the monarchy of France and also Napoleon, leading us to believe that he was more a French nationalist than a pure revolutionary. We spoke about that in the recap as well. A second man, Lorenzo Ferreira, arrived in Lincolnton with a French accent and an octroon mistress, so a mixed a woman of mixed uh, black and white. He purportedly had a chest filled with gold and silver coins. He was well known about town and owned quite a bit of real estate on Main Street in Lincolnton. It was purported that he was none other than Jean Lafitte, the, pri the pirate who helped General An Andrew Jackson defeat the British at the Battle of New Orleans. That's my favorite so far. Jean Lafitte is my favorite. And... I said this in the in the, the Lafitte episode, like everybody in my family is like blonde haired, blue eyed, both sides of my family. And I've always dated like blonde haired, blue eyed boys, but I've always been very attracted to men who are like dark eyed, dark haired and like olive colored skinned. Maybe it's because it's so different from my family. Like my family, I mean, we're, we're we tan pretty easily, but we're very um, Anglican looking. We're very um, 
you know, blue eyed, blonde hair, all of us. So maybe it's because opposites, it's like, it's like, it's different than what I am. But I was looking at pictures of Jean Lafitte, not like, like he, I mean, his actual pictures, no offense. He looked kind of raggard, haggard and raggard. I don't know if raggard's a real word. If it's, I just made it a word, I think. But some of the interpretational paintings of Jean Lafitte, I was like, ooh. This guy, Jean Lafitte, he was not a great guy. Like, he he was heavy into the slave trade. But Lord have mercy, if he had walked into my town in the 1800s, I would have been like... And, I mean, pirates do kind of had a bad, have a bad boy air about them. But he definitely, from that episode, again, that's down in the description box. As I said, obviously this Lorenzo dude was totally giving pirate energy. Like, totally giving off pirate energy, a pirate vibe to everybody in the town, which was not unfamiliar. Again, that was not unfamiliar. Pirates were everywhere here in the south southeast. So, people in the southeast, they knew a pirate when they saw a pirate. And they saw Lorenzo Ferreira and they were like, that's Jean Lafitte. <laughs> that's a damn pirate. That's not some dude. That's that's a pirate. All right, who faked his death, right? So anyway, but let's continue. Finally, in 1825, the Marquis de Lafayette visited all 24 states of the United States of America. It is well documented that La La Lafayette was a noted French nationalist having served in the governing bodies of both the monarchy and the revolutionary governments. It is also well documented that Lafayette visited Fayetteville, North Carolina, Camden, South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, and Nashville, Tennessee. It would not be beyond the realm of possibility that those journeys brought him very close to Lincoln and Gadsden counties. Three very prominent French military men arriving in Lincoln County vicinity during the first quarter of the 19th century at, at first glance would seem to be much more than a coincidence. Though Lincolnton was a fairly prominent frontier town at the time, it did not have the prominence of Charleston, South Carolina, where my family's from, Savannah, Georgia, which is just south of Charleston, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, or many other cities that could be named. Lincolnton was still an out-of-the-way town on the edge of the frontier, not nationally prominent or even prominent in the state. So not only is this town not recognized nationally, but it's one of those really small towns in the state where people in the state probably have never heard of it. Like there are towns in Georgia that people talk about and I've never heard of them because they're tiny, right? So why did these men come to Lincolnton? Who can say for certain? Speculation has been that all three men arrived to check up on a certain resident. They were handlers, as I said. Maybe to offer assistance, maybe to deliver messages either uh, from or to France, it is likely no one will ever know. It does, however, seem to stretch credibility to assume that three of the most prominent French military leaders of the time coincidentally visited Lincolnton, North Carolina during a 15 to 20 year span. All right, you guys, we are going to next talk about Jonas Pesor. But before we do that, let's take a brief word for from one of our sponsors. This is a newer sponsor, Miramate, which is basically almost like it's Tesla, Tesla technology. It's one of those mats you can lay on that really heals your body. So I'm going to let a brief commercial play. Miramate, just so you guys know, it is a sister company of Spooky2, which is Rife Technology. All of the information is down in the description box below. But for both Spooky2 and Miramate, you can use my name, Bryce Watson, that's B-R-I-C-E-W-A-T-S-O-N at checkout. It's a discount coupon, my name, for 5% off any and all purchases for both of these countries. So just hold tight as we hear a brief word from our awesome sponsor, Miramate. Hi, I'm going to talk to you about Miramate today. It is something that I discovered just about two months ago. I had been just fighting excruciating knee pain after I took a back step into a hole and twisted it. I had the usual treatment, you know, they, they checked it out and they said that there was no tear, but there had to have been a tear, even though the knee was just too small to see, because it just wasn't healing. It burned, it hurt, it was bruisy, it, it was swollen, it just wasn't good. And so I tried all the usual, you know, the pain medication, the NSAIDs, and none of that seemed to be helping at all. 
So then I did a little research and thought, well, okay, I'll try a near-infrared device. That device did help some, and now we're talking about two months later. So I hurt my knee in June, and in August I was still hurting. So then I went ahead and ordered this device, and in September I tried it for about three weeks before it started working at all. And it really wasn't taking me over to where I needed to be in order to be able to function, to walk normally, and even to sleep. This thing was keeping me awake. Um, so then I um, talked to a friend about it, and she said, oh, well, you have to try this. You know, here, you get this, this PEMF device from Miramade. It's reasonable, and it works. It'll heal. I didn't believe it, but, of course, when you're in a lot of pain, you're always searching for a solution. So, therefore, I went ahead and ordered it. It came quickly. It was amazing. And this is not an unboxing thing, but I do want to show you that this is the Mini Magic. That is what I ordered. It comes with a power cord. You can use it with batteries. And the standard order comes with this device, which I have taped together because I was using it on my dog. But this is two leads, and you put these on different sides, you know, with the little things poking out, and then you can wrap it up with the elastic bands that they give you. They give you a small one, like if you want to use it for your wrist, and they also give you a big one if you want to use it in any other part of your body. Like for me, it was for my knee. I went ahead and also ordered the quads because I do suffer from back pain and hip pain, and I thought, well, if it cures my knee or makes me feel better that way, then it's bound to work on those pains as well. And that will require the bigger ones. So I ordered the mini with the standard and the quad. It came. I used it immediately. Within three days of using this thing, I started to get relief. Now, mind you, I was just grateful to get relief. But I was like, will it actually heal me? So I continued to use it, and I felt that I wasn't making enough progress. For some reason, it seemed to be working, but not as much. So I decided to use the quad on my knee. And doing that, within a week's time, I was walking normally again. It was an incredible thing. It was amazing, almost miraculous. I mean, it almost brings me to tears because nothing else had worked. Nothing the doctors had done, nothing that I had done on my own. You know, the cold, the heat, all that stuff that they always tell you to do and rest, none of it had worked. And this thing not only took the pain and inflammation away almost instantaneously within those first three days, but within a week's time, I was walking almost completely normally. And by the end of the second week, I actually forgot that I had been injured when I started doing more activities around the house. And so, I'm a believer. Um, in fact, I find that this thing is not only so easy to use, I mean, it has three settings. You can use it with a battery so you can carry it with you. You can plug it in to your computer because it has a USB. You also get a cube, so you can plug it in to electricity. And you can use it any way you'd like, anywhere you'd like. I didn't use it for that long. I only used it for about half an hour to an hour a day. Um, so, um, at first, and then once I realized that it was working, then I started using it a little bit more as recommended. And, of course, now I only use it if and when something flares up. Now, I have come to find that this has made such a difference. With my health issues, I do suffer from pain all the time. And I also got COVID. And with COVID, my vision, for some reason, was affected. If I put these things on, almost like eyeglasses, and just give myself a short treatment, my vision clarifies, so it gets clearer. I don't know how it works or why it works, but it works. So my vision has been improving since I started doing that. In fact, I um, did some more research throughout all of this and found out that not only is it a very safe um, type of method of treatment or therapy, but you can also use it on animals. And so here I have my little guy, Tito. And little Tito, he suffers from dry eye. And so right now I'm spending about $160 a month to treat this little guy's dry eyes. That's a lot of money. Not only that, but I can tell that even though I am giving him his medications religiously three times a day, and he has four medications, that his little eye still hurts because he does a little bit of extra blinking, he scratches at it, and he rubs it. 
But what I have seen and what I have done is I've gone ahead, and that's why these were taped, because I was using them on him. And so I just put them together, so that way I have one. And then I just put it over his eye like that. And then we use it as a bonding time where I just literally cuddle him. And he just gets his treatment about five, to five minutes. That's it. And I have seen some improvement. Even if I'm a little late on his medications, you know, I try to be very religious. But even if I am a tiny bit late, his eye is not drying out as much as it was. And although he's still rubbing, I just started doing this a week or so ago. And it's only five minutes a day. But even though he's still rubbing, it's not quite as bad as it was. So I think it's working. And I'm very eager to continue doing it on a daily basis and see if we can get him to a better place and see what the vet says without telling the vet when he goes in for his treatment in January. I'm excited. I'm also excited and such a believer that I decided to um, purchase the mat and I can't wait to get it. And I look forward to maybe getting better health and less pain. <laughs> anyway, thanks. If you decide to try it, I hope it works as well for you as it did for me. All right, you guys, let's get back into the juicy and scandalous legend of the Pesor family. We're going to talk about Jonas Pesor. Jonas was born in Leakin County in 1819. He was the second child born to Daniel and the firstborn son. Jonas married Harriet Smith in 1845. She was also born in Lincoln County, North Carolina, and her date of birth was Christmas Day in 1823. Lord bless her soul that she was born on Christmas Day. My sister was also born on Christmas Day. For all you Christmas babies out there, my heart goes out to you. That really sucks. I'm so sorry. I feel so bad for my sister because she's never like had a day that's just her day. So God bless you, Harriet Smith, for being born on Christmas Day in 1823. In 1884, Jonas died and was buried in Pleasant Grove Methodist Church Cemetery between the Krause and Howard Creek areas of Leakin County. Harriet lived until 1905, and she too was buried in Pleasant Grove. There are many stories on the internet that state that Adam Pesor was actually Daniel's oldest son. Some even say that he was schmurdered at a young age and that the circumstances of his schmurder are still very much a mystery. The fact is, Adam was the younger brother of Jonas. Adam was actually born in 1833 and lived to the ripe old age of 86, dying in 1919. He was laid to rest in the Paysor Cemetery in Gaston County, and as far as anyone knows, he still remains there. The internet stories about his schmurder are a concoction designed to show some kind of nefarious connection to a conspiracy concerning Daniel's estate. These stories imply that Daniel's estate was stolen from Adam and given to Jonas. This is simply not true. Now, we're going to read a little bit further into this, but I just want to state, like, back in this time, it was very common for the oldest son to actually inherit the father's estate and the other siblings, not so much. This was actually done for a very long time in Western culture, which is kind of fucked up if you ask me. Nowadays, it's pretty common that the children equally inherit their father's or mother's estate, right? Like my sister and I will equally inherit from our mom. Not so sure about our dad because our dad doesn't really dad us. But with today's laws, especially in some states like Georgia with our father, we could definitely fight for his estate because we are his biological children. And usually the courts will show favor, will overturn a will to show favor to the biological children of a person. So, but I just wanted to kind of like give that backstory in case people didn't know. I think most people do know though, that they're saying that Jonas inherited the bulk of Daniel's wealth, but maybe Adam didn't. But they're saying it's because Adam was murdered because he was like the first son and he got rid of so that Jonas can hit because that was pretty common back then. We're going to get into it, though. Doesn't seem like, though, Adam really was. If, if he actually lived to 86 years old, obviously, he probably wasn't murdered by by his brother. But nonetheless, let's keep reading. 
What is true is that often the eldest son received the bulk of the estate when the parents passed away. If that was indeed the case when, with Daniel, then Jonas would have been the rightful heir and there would have been no conspiracy at all. I still think that's kind of messed up that parents would only leave like one child, the bulk. And girls, don't even get me started with the girls. Georgia, I, I talked about this with the Werewolf of Georgia episode that Georgia was one of the first states to allow women to inherit. So what do I mean by that? Um, it was around this time, actually, that Emily Burt, who, or Emmy Burt, who is apparently the Georgia werewolf, that she actually, she never married. She inherited her wealth from her parents. Back for many generations, it was stated that, uh, like, if I had a brother, okay, let's say, like, my sister and I had a brother, and our parents pass away. My sister and I, our part of the inheritance would be held to give to our husbands when we got married. Our brother would hold it and then give it to our husbands. So Georgia was one of the first states to be like, yeah, no, that's not fair. If a woman comes from a wealthy family, she's going to equally inher inherit just like her brothers and it's going to be her money. So go Georgia with that one. It appears that must have been the case. Jonas was known to have have had at least a moderate amount of money in contrast with his brothers and sisters. Shortly before the Civil War, Jonas began buying property. Much of this property was in the city limits of Lincolnton, close to the property that Lorenzo Ferrer was himself buying. As you may remember from an earlier chapter, Ferrer was suspected to have been the noted privateer or pirate Jean Lafitte, and was rumored to have had a chest filled with gold and silver coins. It is not known whether Jonas Pesor and Lorenzo Ferrer knew each other though it can be assumed that they did. Both men were very active in the land acquisition business within the city of Lincolnton, so it would not be surprising that they would have run into each other on numerous occasions. Perhaps they even consolated with each other. Or even, to stretch a point, perhaps Ferrer was an advisor to the oldest son of the lost Dauphin, a handler. We'll just call it what it is, a handler. Jonas's acquisition of property came to a sudden end with the beginning of the Civil War. It seems that not only did he stop buying property, but actually sold quite a bit of what he had acquired. As the war dragged on, Jonas finally went bankrupt. There was some speculation about this, and it came up pretty fast. Many people suspected that he was not really in as dire straits as it appeared, but rather was trying to hide his wealth from the Yankee troops that were expected to enter the area at any time. Yes. Okay. And that's another thing about gold and silver. That's another thing I forgot to mention to you guys. If you ever study William Faulkner, who was a incredible American writer, he, he's no longer living, but he wrote a lot of stories that revolved around the deep South, especially during the era of the civil war and in the unvanquished, which is one of his most famous um, pieces he talks about this. And so not only in the South do we have the legends of pirates burying gold and silver, but during the Civil War, when the Yankees were coming closer to the South, especially when women were alone in their plantations or their houses because their menfolk were off in battle, what they would do is they would take the family silver, the gold, and they would go and bury it in the backyard. This is covered again in The Unvanquished. So there is still a lot of family gold, silver, jewels that are have been forgotten about or if the family's property was seized, sieged or if, you know, a lot of times with these women, if they were left alone on a plantation, a lot of times the Yankees would come in and they would um, R.A.P.E. the women um, and take over their houses, and so the family would be dispersed, and so they didn't know, the soldiers didn't know that there was literal gold and silver buried in the backyard, and so it would just sit there. And so a lot of times people will be, like, remodeling their house or, or be adding on to their property, and they'll pull up, like, silver, you know, silver silverware and, and like teapots of silver that have been buried since the Civil War. And so that's another... Now, so again, not only do we not have like, not only do we have like pirate treasure, but we've also got treasure from people's families that are just still kind of hanging out. I mean, some of the families did go and 
pull it back up after the Civil War, but there's a, quite a quite a few that never got the chance to. So that that's interesting too. It was hiding wealth. It was absolutely hi hiding wealth. So Jonas could have gone and buried a bunch of like metal, like gold and silver, and claiming bankruptcy, like a lot of people did in the South, to hide the wealth from the Union. After the Civil War, Jonas took a very low profile. There were no more extensive buying or selling, and Jonas settled into a life of farming. As with his father, Daniel, there were persistent rumors over the year that Jonas had also had a chest filled with gold and silver buried on his property. This is rather curious that both Daniel and his primary heir, Jonas, were believed by many to have such treasure chest. None of their siblings were thought to have such riches. So why is that? Nothing is really known, but there is speculation. If Daniel had been the lost Alphon, then he obviously had access to a certain amount of money or precious metals. Since Jonas was his heir, it would have passed down to him. As a further curiosity, both Jonas and Lorenzo Ferrer were rumored to have such chests filled with gold and silver. It would have been shown that both men could have a very easily known each other, it was not a tremendous leap to assume that they discussed how to manage their treasures. Not only is there a possibility that both men were of French extraction, but it is distinctly possible that both had strong Freemason connections. The Freemasons always play into this. Jean Lafitte's brother was definitely a Freemason, and it was suspected that Jean Lafitte was also, as was Ferrer, suspected of being a famous privateer. Or pirate. The Masonic connection, though not proven conclusively, is definitely circumstantial, as in the French connection. Let's summarize it. Daniel is suspected of being the crown prince, the lost Dauphin of France, the son of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. It was stated by several family members that he seemed to be very well educated, an assertion that was never made about his brothers and sisters. He lives in the Lincoln County area of North Carolina and is suspected of having a treasure trove of gold and silver, which he has passed on to his oldest son, Jonas. At the same time that Daniel and Jonas are living in the Gaston and Lincoln County areas, a mysterious Frenchman, Peter Stewart Ney, moves into the vicinity. Ney is well-educated and is a master swordsman. His body is covered with many scars that appear to be battle scars. He has an interest in the news of Europe and attempts to unalive himself when hearing of the death of Napoleon. Finally, on his deathbed, Peter Stuart Ney confesses to being Michel Ney, Marshal of France and one of Napoleon's top generals. The Marquis de Lafayette, hero, of the Revolutionary War and devoted French nationalist visited the United States at the invitation of President James Monroe in 1825. He visited every state, including Fayetteville, North Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, and Nashville, Tennessee. In those tra travels, it is likely he could have passed close to Lincoln or Gadsden counties in North Carolina. During his visit to Tennessee, he was hosted and introduced by General Andrew Jackson at the Masonic Lodge in Nashville. Jackson, also a native of North Carolina, grew up only about 50 miles from Lincoln County. General Jackson gained national fame when he commanded the troops against the British at the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812. By just about every account, the battle would not have been won without the help of the French pirate, Jean Lafitte. After the War of 1812, in the first third of the 19th century, another mysterious Frenchman arrives in Lincolnton. His name is Lorenzo Ferrer. His initials are LF. He arrived with an octoroon mistress who North Carolina law would not allow him to marry. So a mulatto, a mixed woman, which is very common from the Creole folk of New Orleans where John Lafitte was from. Eyewitness reported that he had a chest full of gold and silver coins. In fact, in his later years, many of the young boys in town referred to him as the old pirate. He bought much property in downtown Lincolnton at the same time that Jonas was also buying property in Lincolnton. All of this could be a grand coincidence, 
but it does stretch the imagination. Is there a French connection, a royal connection, and a Freemason connection to the history of Lincoln County? All right, you guys, we're going to leave off with a kind of a cliffhanger there. Um, we're going to talk next week about Jesse James. All right, you guys, let me know your thoughts and your comments down in the comment section below. I, I had somebody comment about being a descendant of this family. If you are that person, if you send me an, an email at esotericatlanta at gmail.com and just put your family name in the subject line, if you want to come on my channel and talk about what you know, I would be more than happy to let you do that. If you know Steven or if Steven is watching this, I would love to have you come on my show, buddy, and talk about this. This is fascinating. I'll share with you some of my, uh, we could be related because I'm a descendant of Queen Victoria. So I've got, I've got a lot of, of that royal, and I'm, an, I'm O negative. Like I got a lot of the royal blood in me as well. So I'm also a descendant of, of, of this, this group of people, as many of us are, right? And we're just trying to right some of those wrongs right now. So let me know down in the comment section below. I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day, and I will talk to you very soon. Bye, everybody.